So the topic for today's presentation is on stainless steel crowns in pediatric dentistry. So these are the contents of my presentation today. Gold wires were used in dentistry uh, in ancient times and in the 19th century gold was used to fill cavities. In 1919, Dr. Hartmeier, who is a German uh, dentist, he introduced stainless steel into dentistry. And it was much later in 1950 that Humphrey and Engel first published the article on the use of chrome steel crowns in pediatric dentistry. And Mink and Bennett proposed the first basic preparation which was required for the placement of chrome steel crown in 1968. But it was an era which was dominated by amalgam and it was difficult for dentists to accept any other material to be better than amalgam. And therefore, this led to a number of studies being conducted which compared stainless steel crowns with amalgam restorations. And the results showed a higher success rate in stainless steel crown groups when compared to amalgam restorations. Moving on to the classification of stainless steel crowns, the first classification is based on the form and contour of stainless steel crowns. The first variety is the untrimmed crown, which is not trimmed, which is not festooned, and it requires a lot of time for adaptation over the prepared tooth, and therefore it is very much time consuming. The second variety is the pre-trimmed crowns. These crowns are, uh, have long sides which are still not contoured, but they follow a line parallel to the gingival crest, which is called as festooning. Where, um, but they still require contouring and still require uh, some amount of trimming. Whereas the third variety is the pre-contoured crowns. They are, they are trimmed as well as contoured and they require minimal uh, adjustments for adaptation over the prepared tooth. Then comes the next second classification, which is based on the material used. So based on that, they are, there are stainless steel crowns, nickel chromium crowns, aluminum crowns, and thin silver alloy crowns. Based on the location, there are anterior stainless steel crowns and stainless steel crowns for posterior teeth. So let us look into the composition of stainless steel crowns. Uh, these crowns are made from 18-8 austenitic stainless steel, which have the best corrosion resistance. They also have high ductility. They exhibit a higher strength and greater ease of welding. So this 18-8 stainless steel is composed of 17 to 19% of chromium, 10 to 13% of nickel, 67% is iron, and 4% other minor elements. And then this nickel-based crowns have predominantly nickel, which is about 72%. Chromium is about 14%. There is 6 to 10% of iron, 0.04% of carbon, and other traces of manganese and silicon. These nickel-based crowns have a disadvantage that they need a lot of contouring and a lot of time to adapt over a prepared tooth surface. They require a lot of manipulation. Then let us move on to the availability of these stainless steel crowns. These crowns are available for the upper and the lower, right and left, first and second primary molars. So these crowns are available for each crown. Each crown is available in various sizes. So the first size is size two, then uh, size three, four, five, six, and the largest one is size seven. The most commonly used sizes here are size four and size five, very commonly used. And uh, there is a difference in uh, dimension uh, from one crown to the other crown. It is approximately 0.4 mm. So what are the objectives of placement of a stainless steel crown? First and foremost, you want to maintain proper form and function of the tooth which you want to restore. Then you need to uh, restore a biologically compatible masticatory component with a clinically acceptable restoration. So let us move on to see what are the indications, various indications of, for the placement of these crowns. Firstly, you will place these crowns after you have pulp treated your primary and young permanent teeth. You have done your pulpotomy or pulpectomy, then go on and place these crowns. Yeah, then uh, extensive decay in primary teeth, you know, which uh, involve more than two surfaces, which could be which would be difficult to restore with a conventional restoration. 
and where amalgams are likely to fail, maybe because of recurrent caries. Then you can also place these crowns in teeth with developmental defects like amylogenesis imperfecta, dentinogenesis imperfecta. It is also indicated in fractured teeth and as an abutment for a space maintainer. It also is indicated in infra-occluded primary molars because you want to restore the form and function of the tooth. In patients with bruxism where there is a lot of attrition of the posterior primary teeth, which can lead to loss of vertical dimension of occlusion. It is also indicated in single a correction of a single tooth anterior cross bite, where you place a reverse anterior stainless steel crown is placed in the reverse manner to correct the cross bite. Also, Pinkerton has suggested that child patients who are unlikely to attend recall appointments, they are also um, uh, this is also an indication. And you can place these stainless steel crowns as a preventive measure in special children who lack the ability to cooperate with the dental treatment and who lack proper uh, means of uh, uh, obtaining proper oral hygiene. When they cannot maintain proper oral hygiene, subsequently, there's a lot of plaque accumulation, which leads to the formation of dental caries, which requires more complicated treatment procedures, which they cannot be able to handle. So these special children could be treated by placing stainless steel crowns as a preventive measure. It can also be placed in excessive tooth surface loss, like attrition, abrasion, or erosion of teeth and for temporary restoration of permanent teeth and also in young permanent molars following endodontic therapy. Lastly, it also can be placed when a tooth uh, exhibits extreme sensitivity. So what are the contraindications? There are no absolute contraindications. There are only relative contraindications. So uh, to think about it, the uh, simple thing is you, you cannot place a stainless steel crown when the tooth structure is not adequate for the crown to be fit onto. So inability to fit the crown is a contraindication. And wherever conservative restorations could be placed, why do you want to place a stainless steel crown? Then a tooth which uh, is about to exfoliate within the next six to 12 months, patients with known nickel allergies and partially erupted teeth where you cannot do proximal preparation properly. So it is better for you to wait till the tooth erupts completely and then do preparation and then place the crown. So what are the various advantages of placing a stainless steel crown? It is almost always superior to multi-surface amalgam restorations. It also provides protection to the remaining weakened tooth structure and it has a very high success rate. It is, the longevity is excellent. It is durable, it is cost effective. It doesn't really cost much to the clinician and you can charge accordingly to your patient as well. And it is not really technique sensitive. It is pretty easy to place a stainless steel crown once you master the technique and it doesn't really take much time. So having said all these advantages, the only disadvantage which we can think of regarding stainless steel crown is its aesthetics. Let us proceed on to see what are the various uh, instruments we require during crown pre tooth preparation and crown adaptation. Firstly, you will require a rubber dam kit, then crown cutting burrs, you need your uh, hoe pliers, which is number 10, hoe, uh, hoe utility pliers, number 114, Johnson contouring pliers. The next is the crimping plier, and then that is crown removing plier. If uh, crown removing plier is not available, you could also use a spoon excavator to remove the crown. You also need a sickle scaler, crown and bridge scissors, and a band seater. Then you need various uh, green stone burr, abrasive wheels for finishing and polishing of the crown after you trim it. Then uh, the looting cement and you also need dental floss and a gauze square. So let us proceed with a stepwise uh, tooth preparation and crown adaptation, the technique. So first and foremost, you have to evaluate the preoperative occlusion of the patient. So what do you check? when you evaluate it. First, check whether the midline is deviated, check the cusp and fossa relationship, whether there is any extrusion of the opposing tooth, whether caries has led to the mesial drift of the teeth, 
And after you have checked all of these things, make sure to take a wax bite of your patient before you proceed with the tooth preparation. So local anesthesia, it is recommended to uh, have adequate local anesthesia uh, to minimize any uh, pain. Then comes rubber dam application. Rubber dam application here can be modified by cutting the interproximal dam and then placing it over the uh, tooth. So this is called as the trough technique. So this will prevent entanglement of the burr when you are doing your proximal reduction. One more thing which you have to take into consideration whenever you are doing a tooth preparation for stainless steel crown under rubber dam is if the tooth to be uh, prepared is the same uh, uh, tooth to be clamped, then the entire uh, reduction is done uh, or except for after uh, entire reduction is done with the clamp except for the distal slice. So the distal slice can be done after removing the clamp. Also, whenever you place a rubber dam, you can check for the occlusal reduction by comparing the uh, tooth which you are reducing by comparing it with the adjacent tooth. So if you do not want to use the trough technique, there is also another consideration of using wedges. Wedges will separate the neighboring teeth and therefore it will minimize the risk of uh, damaging or abrading the adjacent teeth whenever you are doing your proximal preparation. It also has an added advantage to help depress the gingival tissue and the rubber dam. So what are the various advantages of doing this preparation under rubber dam? First is you can protect the surrounding tissue, you can improve the visibility and the if working efficiency of the operator to better manage the behavior of the child and to prevent ingestion of the stainless steel crowns during your uh, crown adaptation procedures. So what is the disadvantage? You cannot really check the clearance and occlusion when you have the dam in place. So you may have to check for the clearance and occlusion only after you remove the clamp. So alternately, if you're not using your rubber dam, you can make use of a gauze square which can be packed into the back of the mouth to protect the airway and prevent the ingestion or aspiration of the stainless steel crowns. So how do you go about selection of the crown? So the crown with the right size is selected and the crown which restores the tooth to its normal contour and occlusal anatomy is selected. So primary teeth undergo attrition and therefore it is not appropriate for us to use a crown with a large well-defined cusp. So how will you know the tooth, the crown you have selected is of the right size? The first thing you do, there are two options. One is you can select the crown before tooth preparation and next you can do it even after the tooth preparation. So before tooth preparation, simply you can measure the mesodistal dimension of the tooth you are preparing with the help of a Bolli's cage or a digital vernier caliper, or simply you can make use of a divider and a ruler. And after preparation, you can select the crown by a trial and error method. First, you will make, uh, uh, you will use the smallest crown. You will try that and then proceed on to the larger crowns. So there are three main considerations when you select a crown. The first thing is adequate mesodistal diameter of the crown. Uh, uh, it should be adequate so as to restore the adequate mesodistal diameter of the tooth. It should have a light resistance to seating and it should restore the proper occlusal height of the tooth. Let us proceed with the tooth preparation. So what are the aims of tooth preparation? Firstly, it, it is to provide sufficient space for stainless steel crown and then to remove the caries and leave sufficient tooth structure for the retention of the crown. But there are two different schools of thoughts. You know, some authors say that occlusal reduction should be done first, and some authors say that the proximal reduction should be first uh, uh, should be done first. Uh, so the advantage of doing occlusal reduction first is that you can have better access to the proximal areas of the tooth to be prepared if you reduce the occlusal portion of the tooth first. So let us see how will we go about the occlusal reduction of teeth. So occlusal reduction, first, you can place depth orientation grooves one mm deep onto the uh, 
uh, onto the tooth to be prepared and then you will connect these uh, depth orientation grooves to, to get a uniform reduction of the occlusal aspect of the crown. So uh, once you do it, you should make sure that the contour of the cusps is maintained even after you have prepared the tooth. Then you should reduce the occlusion by about 1 to 1.5 mm and you can uh, you can know whether you have done adequate reduction by comparing it with the adjacent tooth. So in case there is gross loss of tooth structure, if you remove 1 to 1.5 mm from one or two cusps, maybe that is sufficient. So how do you evaluate occlusal reduction? Uh, I told you that before, you know, pre-operative wax bite should be taken. So after occlusal reduction also, you could take a wax bite and check whether there is indent some in any indentation at all, which is seen on the wax bite of the prepared tooth, which means that you have not done the occlusal reduction correctly and you may have to redo it. Uh, Matthewson has suggested that the use of an explorer and visually, if you examine, you will know whether you have done it adequately or not. And alternately, you can uh, compare it with the adjacent marginal ridge, the cusp height of the adjacent tooth, or even you can compare it with the lingual or the buccal developmental groove. And after uh, you have done your occlusal reduction, there should be adequate clearance between the maxillary and the mandibular tooth. So regarding the proximal reduction, you use a tapered fissure burr, and you have to keep uh, there should not be, the burr should not be angle, angulated too much when you are doing proximal reduction. You can, uh, you can begin uh, the proximal reduction by placement of interproximal wedges. I've already told you what are the advantages of using wedges. Then you can begin cutting the marginal ridge in a buccolingual sweeping motion gradually, which progresses towards the gingival margin, or you could directly slice the distal aspect of the crown. That depends on uh, the comfort of the operator, whatever. So uh, you can also uh, avoid, you should avoid damage to the adjacent tooth. If you are not using wedges, there is another option of uh, fabricating a T-band and placing it over the, around the tooth which you are preparing. Uh, and this T-band will make sure that you do not abrade the adjacent tooth in any manner. So the reduction should be nearly vertical to the long axis of the tooth. Maximum angulation which is permitted is about 10 degrees. But if you angulate the burr a little too much, it could lead to an over tapered preparation and the crown selection and adaptation would be cumbersome. So one thing very important during proximal reduction, if you do not uh, place the burr correctly, it will lead to interproximal ledge formation, which should be avoided at all costs. How do you evaluate proximal reduction? An explorer, if you use an explorer, you should be able to pass it around the uh, prepared tooth easily. And if you are using a burr, it should pass just by touching the adjacent teeth. And also there should not be any prox uh, uh, proximal ledge formation. So do you have to prepare the proximal uh, aspect of the tooth even when the adjacent tooth is not present? So this is especially true when uh, there is no tooth present distally, especially in uh, children with exclusive primary dentition when your first permanent molar has not erupted and you have to place a crown on E, uh, whether a maxillary or mandibular. Even when the distal tooth is not present, you should go ahead and do your distal proximal preparation also. Failure to follow this recommendation will lead to selection of an oversized crown, which will later uh, hamper the eruption of your permanent first molar. So this is what will happen. This is an oversized crown which is fitted and your first permanent molar is about to erupt and this will inhibit the proper eruption of the first permanent molar. So buccal and lingual reduction, is it actually required? When you compare uh, the buccal and lingual aspect of a primary tooth with a, post, uh, with a uh, permanent tooth, you will see that buccally and lingually, the primary tooth, there is a marked convergence occlusally, which is directed occlusally, whereas there is less convergence in a 
uh, permanent tooth. So this has to be maintained even when you are doing your tooth preparation. So buccal and lingual reduction is only limited to the occlusal one third of the crown where you know you just have to round and, and smoothen the edges. You have to round off all the line angles and the point angles which could be created during occlusal and proximal reduction of the tooth. Also, we should remember that the primary teeth have a very prominent major buccal bulge on the buccal aspect of the crown, which leads to retention of these crowns. It acts as a natural undercut, which will help in the retention of these crowns. Uh, various authors have suggested that it is actually unnecessary for natural, uh, unnecessary to prepare your buccal and lingual uh, aspects of primary teeth during stainless steel crown tooth preparation because they act as natural undercuts for retention, except when uh, there is a very huge prominent buccal bulge which is seen on the primary mandibular first molar which will make seating of the crown difficult. So that is only an exception where uh, it is permitted to reduce the buccal bulge a little bit to facilitate placement of the crown. Whereas various other authors have suggested that the buccal and lingual reduction will give a gingivally inclined bevel which helps in seating of the crown. Dougal and Curzon have suggested that one should first try the crown before carrying out any buccal and lingual reduction. If you can take your crown and place it over the prepared tooth once your proximal and your occlusal reduction is done, if you can place the crown readily, then there is no need for you to go on with your buccal and lingual reduction. So first try out the crown and then decide whether you have to do your buccal or lingual reduction. So how will you evaluate the crown preparation? First, check whether there is any occlusal clearance, check whether there is any, the, the proximal contour is maintained or not. There shouldn't be any ledge formation. All the point angles and line angles should be rounded off and there should be, the occlusal clearance should be proper. It should be adequate. So then the next step is adaptation of the crown. So the crown, which is the smallest, the, uh, smallest crown that fits onto the prepared tooth is the one which should be selected and the crown should exhibit a slight resistance to seating which will help in retention of these crowns and when you place this crown it should actually click you can hear a clicking sound it should snap fit into position so once that is done once the crown is fit you can see some amount of blanching in the uh, marginal gingiva. So this blanching tells you that the, the crown has gone beyond the marginal uh, gingiva and it has extended uh, a lot. So you have to maintain the subgingival extension. You have to limit it to about one mm. So you have to take necessary precautions to make sure that it is not more than that. So mesiodistal inclina uh, inclination of the path, it should be parallel to the uh, uh, it should be parallel to the margins of the adjacent tooth. If you tilt, if you incline it with a mesially or distally, it will result in locking out of the crown and you cannot place that. So using the thumb forceps, select the crown. Uh, then uh, making use of a forcep also keeps contamination to a minimum. Then after you have the crown with you, try out the crown. On your mandibular teeth, the crown is uh, first fit on the lingual side and then it is rotated on the buccal side. For the maxillary, you could place it on the buccal and then push it towards the lingual. So by doing that, the crown should fit and it may have a gingival ex excess of about 2 to 3 mm, which is seen uh, in the form of blanching. So once you see blanching, you take your sickle scaler and mark a scratch line over the uh, which approximate over the crown, which approximating to the approximating with the marginal gingiva. So once you do it, uh, remove the crown again and trim uh, with the help of your crown uh, scissor. Trim the crown one mm below the scratch line. This will make sure that the crown is extending one mm subgingival. So place the crown again, uh, and if blanching is seen, you may have to retrim the crown. And always remember, whenever you do this trial and error method and you trim the crown and reposition it, replace it and 
again uh, uh, assess the occlusion, again remove it and re retrim it, you should make sure that you have to smoothen the edges of the stainless steel crown because when you trim the crown, you create sharp edges which could harm the marginal gingiva and you definitely would not want to do that. So always it is better for you to smoothen the edges and polish it and only then you try it onto the prepared tooth. So there are two uh, principles which are very important when it comes to crown adaptation, uh, which was given by Spedding. The first uh, principle, Spedding's adaptation principle is based on the crown length. Uh, according to that, you should, once you place the crown, it should restore the correct occlusogingival crown length. And the second principle is based on the crown margins. So the crown margins should be placed, uh, should follow circumferentially, they should follow the natural contours of the gingiva, of the tooth to be prepared. So the buccal gingival contour of the second primary molar is a smile shape. So this is the buccal aspect and the buccal gingival contour is a smile shape. Whereas the first mandibular primary molar, it, uh, it is the buccal gingival contour is in the form of a stretched out S. The proximal gingival contour of the primary molars is a frown shape, whereas the lingual uh, proximal co uh, lingual contour, lingual gingival contour of all the primary molars is a uh, is a smile shape. So you have to make sure you should replicate this in your crown as well. So crown adaptation. Once you uh, now you have you are done with your tooth preparation, you have even picked a crown from the crown kit. Uh, so you have placed the crown, you have checked for blanching, you have trimmed it, and then again you have um, uh, polished it and placed it again, checked. So the next step for you to do is contouring of the crown. So whenever you trim the crown, the crown tends to become wider. So the contouring uh, has a function of restoring the anatomic features in the crown. So for contouring of the crown, you can make use of ball and socket pliers or the Johnson's contouring pliers. Contouring is done in the middle third of the crown. The bulbous portion of the uh, contouring plier is placed inside the crown at uh, approximating the middle third of the crown and it is passed on through the circumference of the crown to create a belling effect which will restore the natural, con uh, which will uh, simulate natural contours of a uh, tooth. What are you trying to achieve after doing contouring? So if you look at the picture, the picture on the left, after trimming, the, con the proximal portion of the crown tends to be flattened, whereas this is after contouring. If you can look closely, the contouring, that is, it will simulate the natural tooth. And moving on, we'll proceed with crown crimping. After contouring is done, we will proceed with crimping of the crown. So crimping is done with the help of a crimping plier. Uh, you bend the gingival margin gently inwards using these crimping pliers. So this crimping enhances mechanical retention of the crown it avoid, uh, and avoidance of exposure of cement to oral fluids and also maintains the gingival health. So after crimping, you should be able to appreciate here the, the cervical portion of the uh, crown, it is bent inwards, yes, which will definitely facilitate in retention of the crown. So contouring is done in the middle third of the crown, whereas crimping is done on the cervical third of the crown. Moving on to crown finishing. So once you have done all this stuff, you have manipulated the crown enough and created a lot of irregularities and uh, sharp margins on the tooth, on, on, sorry, on the crown. So you should finish it and polish it. So if you leave the crown unpolished, it could lead to accumulation of plaque and gingivitis. So you can, you, you can use various burrs. You can use a green stone burr. You could use rubber wheels and wire brush to polish the entire crown. And rouge or whiting could also be used to give a fine luster to the crown. So how, after all this is done, then you will place the crown over the prepared tooth structure to check the final adaptation of the crown. So 
there are six important things which you have to check when you check for the final adaptation of the crown number one being the crown should not rock when finger pressure is applied so absolutely it's a no no you cannot uh, say that uh, this is finally adapted if there is any amount of rocking upon finger pressure uh, application of finger pressure next there should not be any uh, next uh, your crown should extend at least 1 mm subgingivally the third thing is it should be appro it should approximate with the marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth then moderate occlusal forces should not displace the crown in any manner then there should not be any opening between the crown and the uh, marginal gingiva which will lead to plaque accumulation and gingivitis lastly your crown should follow the natural gingival contour of the tooth so all this uh, should be checked and if all this is correct you are good to go with cementation so cementation once uh, the crown is selected once everything is done it is polished finished you have to make sure that you clean the tooth and the crown as well to remove any debris with from trimming the crown so once you have done it uh, maintain proper isolation because isolation should be adequate then you start mixing the looting cement and approximately the crown should be filled approximately two-thirds of the crown should be filled with the looting cement and it, you should make sure that all the inner surfaces of the crown should be coated with the cement then once this is done you should seat the crown from lingual to buccal which i have already told you on the mandibular teeth you place the crown you seat the crown from lingual to buccal whereas on the maxillary teeth you do it from the buccal aspect to the lingual aspect so once you see the crown, you will see that excess cement will be expressed out from all the sides. Uh, so once you see the crown with the help of finger pressure, you can place a, a cotton roll and ask the patient to bite it, or you could even make use of a band seater. You can place it over the uh, placed crown and ask the patient to bite properly in, uh, uh, so that the excess cement extrudes out. And all the extruded cement should be removed with the help of an explorer or also you can make use of a uh, of dental floss interproximally which with a tied knot technique, you know, you can remove the excess cement from the interproximal areas with the help of a floss. So having seen all the steps in preparation, let us move on to discuss briefly regarding the retention of these stainless steel crowns once placed. So various authors have said, uh, come up with various conclusions that why, uh, what, uh, what, uh, how is the retention? What, uh, what is the uh, thing which contributes to the retention of these stainless steel crowns? So uh, it could be because uh, the sub, uh, the crown is extended subgingivally to about one mm. Retention could be because of that, or it could also be because of the natural undercut regions uh, natural undercuts in the form of prominent cervical bulge then mesial and distal slices uh, that uh, lead to the retention then cutting vertical grooves around the prepared tooth that could lead to mechanical uh, retention then mechanical retention is increased uh, when the crowns are properly trimmed and contoured so to know what exactly uh, contributes to retention there was a study conducted by Savid and others in 1979 uh, and they, uh, they actually studied five different types of tooth preparations. So uh, these five different types of tooth preparations were adapted with a stainless steel crown and retention was assessed before and after cementation. So before cementation, it was concluded that tooth preparations which maintain the greatest amount of buccal and lingual tooth structure are the most retentive whereas after cementation it was noticed that almost all the tooth preparations were retentive enough so matthewson concluded that the retention of a stainless steel crown is related more to the cement than to the mechanical adaptation of the crown so finally after you have uh, 
cemented the crown into position, you will check the occlusion. So how will you check? Conventionally, you will uh, check for the occlusion uh, of the contralateral side. You can even make use of the articulating papers. Then uh, if you have a final uh, crown, which is placed a little bit high, which means that it did not actually simulate the preoperative occlusion and the crown is a little bit high. Uh, even when the stainless steel crowns are placed high in occlusion, they do not actually cause many problems to children because occlusion tends to settle down within a matter of about 30 days. But you should always avoid interferences of greater than 1.5 millimeters. So lack of symptoms in children, even though the stainless steel cr crown is placed high, is attributed to children's considerable capacity for them to compensation. So now that we have discussed the various uh, indications, contraindications, the technique of tooth preparation for primary teeth, there are stainless steel crowns available even for permanent molars. That is for young permanent teeth when you, you can place your uh, stainless steel crowns on your young permanent teeth. So the indications, the procedure of tooth preparation is almost is all the same. And the only consideration which you have to take into account after placing a stainless steel crown on a permanent molar is that the occlusion should be correct after you cement the crown into position. If there is no scope for leaving a high point or the occlusion to be high after you place a stainless steel crown on a permanent molar because it could be uh, problematic to the child. So as in any case, as after any uh, procedure in the oral cavity, uh, you have to give uh, you should remember you are treating a child and you should give proper post-operative instructions both to the child as well as the parents and they should be told this repeatedly to understand what they are supposed to do after you place the stainless steel crown so uh, the most important instruction you give to the parents and the child is that once the crown is placed the child cannot eat sticky or hard candies from for the life of the crown yes so doing that it is uh, it is possible that the crown may be dislodged what are the special considerations we have to take regarding stainless steel crowns so first thing is checking occlusion under ga so i told you one of the indications is of placing a stainless steel crown is in special children who cannot maintain proper oral hygiene you can do it as a preventive measure you place stainless steel crowns and it can be done at one go under general anesthesia you can just do it at once all the primary molars could be fitted with your stainless steel crowns at one go under general anesthesia so in uh, so how will you check occlusion there so a simple trick is to make a preoperative impression and keep it intact, then go on about with your uh, tooth preparation and adapt the crown. And once you have adapted the crown, cut off the uh, buckle part of the impression and place that impression over the uh, placed uh, the crowns which you have placed. And this will tell you whether the crown approximates with the proper uh, with the impression material. If it approximates, it will tell you that the occlusion is correct. And uh, if you do not want to follow uh, this technique, you can always uh, uh, check with um, um, check the occlusion by comparing uh, the stainless steel crown with the adjacent tooth. What I have told you, you can compare it with the marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth. Then you have to consider that a child could ingest or aspirate these crowns. If you are not using rubber dam, if you are not using your gauze piece, as I have told you, uh, there is one more simple technique which you could do uh, to make sure that the crown is not ingested or aspirated. So here, you know, you could uh, make use of small band uh, of orthodontic uh, band material and you can create an anchor and you can contour it. And once the anchor is 
ready you can weld it spot weld it onto the most uh, prominent portion of the crown so usually you can do it on the buckle aspect of the mandibular crowns and on buckle aspect of the mandibular crowns and on the palatal aspect of the maxillary crown so once the anchor is in its uh, position you can just uh, take a uh, 10 to 12 inches of dental floss and tag it over the anchor and you have to pull the uh, you have to pull onto the floss multiple times to make sure that it doesn't come off the anchor doesn't come off and you can go go ahead with your tooth uh, uh, adaptation of the crown and once you are satisfied with the final adaptation you could just uh, remove the uh, anchor with the help of a burr so reuse of crowns many dentists try multiple crowns you know when you when you are using a trial and error technique you will first take a, the smallest crown which will fit over the tooth and then you will proceed on with the larger ones and then finally there will be only one crown which you will ultimately fit over the tooth so the other crowns you should make sure that you sterilize them properly by autoclaving and only then you go ahead and reuse these crowns so in case of bruxism so uh, even after placing a tooth, uh, placing a stainless steel crown uh, on the primary posterior teeth in patients with bruxism, these patients can come back to you with occlusal wear facets, you know. So it is like a failure of a stainless steel crown. So you can modify your stainless steel crown uh, to facilitate, uh, uh, to compensate for that. So what can you do? You can, if you have selected a size five crown uh, as the final crown, which you want to adapt over the tooth. So you can uh, keep that size five crown and you can take a size four crown and cut only the occlusal portion of the size four crown. So once that is done, you will place that size four crown occlusal aspect inside the uh, size five crown and you will weld it. Yes, so that will reinforce the occlusal aspect of the crown, which can better take up uh, the forces of bruxism. So this was suggested by Theodore uh, Kroll. So the next thing is the Hall technique, which was proposed by Dr. Norna Hall, who was a Scottish, who is a Scottish dentist. Uh, and who developed and used this technique for over 15 years before she retired in uh, 2006. This uh, Hall technique does not require any local anesthesia or tooth preparation, and it is an ultra conservative method where you just seal the tooth uh, with a stainless steel crown. So how do you go about it? Make sure you uh, the child is seated in an upright position because Again, upright position. If the child is seated in an upright position, it will prevent the ingestion or aspiration of the crown. Then, uh, smallest size of the crown which would seat is chosen. Then, after you have selected, the, uh, the crown should cover all the cusps with a f and it should have a slight feeling of spring back. And once you get that feeling of spring back, you should make sure that you should not seat the crown completely because if you do that, it would be very difficult for you to remove the crown again. So then once you have selected the crown, you will uh, mix the looting cement and uh, uh, fill, the, fill uh, almost two thirds of the crown with the looting cement. And then this uh, crown is placed over the tooth and partially seated until the crown is engaged with the contact points. Then either you can seat the crown with the help of your uh, finger pressure or you could, may, you could ask the patient to bite on a cotton roll or a band seater. Uh, so whatever is easy, that could be followed. So once that is done, the extruded cement is again, it should be removed from the margins and the child should be asked to bite firmly on the ground for the next two to three minutes. So this is hall technique. So hall technique, sometimes uh, it could be difficult for us to, to place hall crowns, especially when there are tight contact areas present. So here you could uh, place uh, orthodontic separators and uh, leave them for about three to five days for a separation of these teeth to occur. And after that, you can go ahead with a hall technique. So the next consideration is banding on stainless steel crowns. So 
as an abutment to a space maintainer if you are using a stainless steel crown so if you want to uh, band something band a space maintainer over a stainless steel crown it is recommended that you should roughen the internal surface of the band and also the external surface of the crown to facilitate adequate retention of this uh, appliance so after all this let us see what could lead to failure of stainless steel crowns so one thing you uh, is poor tooth preparation, you have not an adequate, adequate reduction, uh, poor crown adaptation, selecting an oversized crown or an undersized crown, uh, improper cementation methods, and, and uh, isolation is not maintained, uh, failure of pulp treatment. If you are placing a stainless steel crown on a pulp treated tooth and the pulp treatment fails. So uh, obviously stainless steel crown also, it's considered as a failure. Then if you have fitted a large size crown over a tooth, larger crown over a tooth, it could lead to induced ectopic eruption of first permanent molars. Then uh, recurrent caries and attrition of the crown. So let us proceed with the various modifications which can be done with stainless steel crowns. So if you have to place stainless steel crowns on adjacent teeth, how do you go about it? So if you're doing it on adjacent teeth, you should make sure that you should prepare the occlusal reduction of one tooth entirely first, and then proceed to do the occlusal reduction of the adjacent tooth. If you do both, uh, if you reduce the, uh, if you proceed with the occlusal reduction simultaneously for both teeth, there is a chance that you will over reduce it, which is definitely not recommended because you always have to retain as much tooth structure as possible. Yes, and if you are doing, proc uh, when you proceed with a proximal reduction uh, uh, for a uh, placement of adjacent stainless steel crowns, a little more uh, reduction proximally of uh, uh, mesial and distal surfaces of both teeth should be done uh, so that uh, it will uh, facilitate proper crown adaptation. So these are the things which you should consider when adjacent stainless steel crowns are placed. So what should you do when you uh, have to place a crown uh, in areas of space loss? So if it is a single tooth uh, which you have to replace, uh, where interproxim long-standing interproximal decay was there and the adjacent tooth has moved to encroach that space. So you select a larger crown. So here what happens is consider this is a mandibular tooth and the uh, uh, tooth distal to the uh, uh, tooth to be prepared has encroached onto the space. So because of the interproximal caries, the mesiodistal dimension of the tooth is reduced and therefore the buccolingual dimension is more than the mesiodistal dimension of the tooth. So what will you do here? You can select a larger crown and once you select a larger crown, with the help of your hoe plier, you can just flatten the mesial and distal marginal uh, uh, aspects of this crown. So to facilitate placing of this crown over the prepared tooth structure. And uh, once you flatten it, again, you just have to contour all the slides, uh, sorry, all the sides. So alternately, there is one more trick where you could make use of the opposing contralateral tooth. Okay, for example, I told you, if you have to place a crown on uh, seven four, okay, on seven four, and uh, there was an interproximal decay, and it has led to a loss in mesodistal dimension of the tooth. And uh, there is greater uh, buccolingual dimension of the tooth than the mesodistal dimension of the tooth. So what will what will you do here? You will select five four. So contralateral uh, tooth from the opposing arch is selected and placed onto the. Tooth. So this is one of the tricks you, which you can follow. So same vice versa can be done even on the maxillary teeth. So this is an example. So this, if you look at this, this is a mandibular tooth, mandibular crown, which is fitted onto a maxillary first primary molar. 
So if you have to place uh, uh, in case of mesodistal drift of teeth and where you, you have to place adjacent crowns and there's a lot of space which uh, has been lost, you could compensate for that by selecting smaller sized crowns. And you could also go ahead and reduce the buccal and lingual tooth walls to facilitate mm -hmm. placement of the smaller uh, stainless steel crowns. So what will happen if you uh, select an oversized crown, it will tend to rotate on the tooth preparation and uh, excessive time will be wasted to, uh, in attempting to adapt the crown over the tooth. So if, if oversized crown is placed on a first primary molar, it may encroach the primate space and prevent mesial migration of mandibular first permanent molar, which is the early mesial shift. And if Sorry, a large... Ramen. Yes, sir. Sorry, just to interfere. We've got four minutes more. Just to yes. let you know. Thank yes. you. So if we place it on, uh, if we place an oversized crown on a second primary molar, it will prevent the normal eruption of the first permanent molar. So if you appreciate, uh, you can appreciate it in this picture. This is a larger crown, which is fit on this tooth and the first permanent molar is about to erupt and this will uh, inhibit the correct uh, eruption of the first permanent molar. So preparing a stainless steel crown adjacent to a class two amalgam restorations. How, how will you go about it? So first thing is you will prepare the, uh, uh, will, you will go ahead with the tooth preparation for stainless steel crown. You will finish that. Then you will even prepare the cavity. Once cavity is prepared, you will adapt the stainless steel crown into position. So once that is in place, you will place a matrix band uh, and then you will condense amalgam. After that is done, after the initial set, you will remove the uh, matrix band and then final uh, uh, carving is done. After that, once uh, the amalgam is set, you can remove the stainless steel crown now and then cement it into position. So this, is, this makes sure that the contours are properly maintained. So various other modifications are there, like uh, there is an undersized tooth or a, and an oversized crown. So in this case, you will cut, uh, you will, uh, uh, cut the buccal aspect of the crown vertically and then you will approximate the two portions of the crown. You will overlap them and you will, so you will weld it into place and then you will solder it and polish it and then you can place the crown. Similarly, for an oversized tooth and an undersized crown, you can, uh, after making a vertical cut on the buccal aspect of the crown, you will pull apart the uh, crown and then you will uh, take a small piece of a band material, stainless steel band material, and you will weld it into position. So again, this can be placed on the crown. So in case of deep proximal lesions, you can make use of non-festooned crowns here. So if you do not have a non-festooned crown, then you can always use the technique which I told you before. Take a small um, strip of your band material and then uh, weld it into position and then place that over the defect. In case of open contacts, you always make sure that there is no open contact. You should always make sure that the contacts are closed, as closely approximated as possible. So in case you cannot do it uh, uh, with uh, your, cr uh, your crown, you could always, you know, Oh, uh, exaggerated uh, contouring of the crown can help in create, getting a closed contact with the adjacent tooth. So open contact should never be there. So uh, I just wanted to mention a little bit about open faced stainless steel crowns, which were used ages ago, not anymore though. So what was done here was uh, primary anterior stainless steel crowns, you know, for anterior teeth, they were placed on the primary anterior teeth and cemented. And once that was done, a window was prepared by cutting the labial portion of the uh, stainless steel crown and undercuts were created. And then it was filled with composite resin and cured. So this was what was there, uh, the only option which was there ages ago for primary anterior teeth. Let us move on to see the various complications of stainless steel crowns. 
So the first thing is interproximal ledge formation. So improper angulation of your tapered fissure bird during proximal reduction will lead to your interproximal ledge formation. And if you want to remove this interproximal ledge, again, you should make sure you should do it very cautiously because you do not want any uh, pulp exposure. Yes, overzealous uh, reduction to remove the ledge will can lead to pulp exposure. So you want to avoid that. And if you do not remove this ledge, again, when you, you cannot actually place that crown over the root structure at all. So you should make sure that the interproximal ledge is not created in the first place. So then there is something called as tilting of the crowns. So whenever there is destruction of a, a complete buccal wall or a lingual wall of a tooth, uh, and you prepare the crown and uh, you seat the crown, there is always a tilt of this stainless steel crown towards the deficient side. So this can be prevented uh, by uh, prepare by restoring the tooth correctly before uh, crown, before tooth preparation. This doesn't really hold any clinical significance except where this uh, crown tilt is seen on permanent uh, first molars. So on permanent first molars, if you fit a stainless steel crown and there's a crown tilt, it could lead to the unfavorable supra eruption of the opposing tooth. So you do not want that. So make sure there is no crown tilt. Then comes again, ingestion and aspiration of the crown. Uh, fortunately, these things are very rare and in cautious patients, uh, the cough reflex prevents ingestion or inhalation of the crown. But this is seen more commonly in sedated patients or in special children whose uh, laryngeal reflexes are suppressed. So in those cases, once you cannot find the crown in the oral cavity and you are not sure whether the uh, patient has whether the patient has ingested it or it has lodged itself into the airway you should immediately send the patient for a chest x-ray to know whether it is in the lungs or in the bronchi so if you find it on the chest x-ray make sure you send the patient to get make sure the patient gets appropriate medical attention and uh, bronchoscopy is done to remove the crown uh, Ingestion, although is of much less consequence, uh, if the crown is ingested, it will usually uh, pass uneventfully through the elementary tract and it will be expelled. But the parents have to undergo an unpleasant task of locating the crown which is expelled. So you should make sure you follow necessary precautions to prevent inhalation or ingestion. Let me repeat again. The first thing you could do is use of rubber dam, then use of a gauze piece, then tagging the crown with the help of a floss and making the patient sit in an upright position. So poor margins. <coughs> Dr. Well fit yes, sir. We are overshooting the time. So it will only take a couple of more minutes. Okay, fine. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. So a well-adapted crown will facilitate good oral hygiene and it will uh, make sure the gingiva is healthy. So there should not be any uh, open contact, any opening between the crown and the marginal gingiva. Or if uh, there is any cement residue left, it could lead to plaque accumulation and uh, gingivitis. So you want to avoid that. Occlusal wear, again, I told you already in, in patients with bruxism, uh, if the patient comes back to you with a crown which is severely damaged, you have no choice but to uh, replace the crown. And uh, if your patient uh, comes to you with a, a small, conf uh, small air, uh, wear, which is confined to a very small area, you could try and restore the, that area with the help of amalgam. So then the last uh, complication, it could be nickel allergy, although it is very, very rare. And... Uh, systemic uh, toxic effects from uh, nickel released from stainless steel crowns are almost always improbable and it is difficult to evaluate nickel release in the oral cavity so you don't know uh, whether you know your patient is allergic to nickel and once you place the crown and if your patient begins to develop uh, perioral lesions and you cannot correlate that with any other etiology, then you can think of sending your patient with, for a skin patch test. And if the patient comes back positive with it, you have no other 
uh, choice but to replace um, the tooth. Yes, you cannot use a stainless steel crown in those children. So to conclude, uh, stainless steel crowns, I could say is one of the best things to have happened to pediatric dentistry. These are durable, they have a uh, high longevity and they're easy to uh, place. And uh, the only drawback which I can think of is regarding is aesthetics. And uh, now there are so many aesthetic crowns available. So if the parents or the child uh, is really concerned regarding the aesthetic, then always, you know, there are many, many options available now for po primary and posterior uh, primary teeth uh, aesthetic crowns are available. So that is, uh, inshallah, that topic could be dealt with later. So these are the references. And thank you all for being so patient with me. Thank, thank you. Dr. Amreen, um, thank you everyone. It was a wonderful talk and uh, has been uh, providing us with ample knowledge about stainless steel crowns. Um, do you mind not sharing your screen now, please, so we could go into the question and answer session? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Nadi Mahmud to take over. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum to all the GTP members and uh, assalamu alaikum to the panel panelists and to the uh, speaker. Fantabulous uh, presentation, alhamdulillah. Can we have the uh, videos of the speaker as well as the panel member? Yes, sir. Dr. Yasin, can you unmute Dr. Yasin and his video, please? Dr. Yasin? Yeah, yes, Dr. Assalamu alaikum. I'm here. Assalamu alaikum. Hope my voice is uh, crisp and clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, sir. Fine, fine. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. First of all, I would like to, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the Making Such and Peace of Webinar, Informative and in uh, regarding presentation, mashallah, it was a wonderful presentation from Dr. Zinat. She has covered most of the points related to stainless steel crown. A uh, few things I need to add is, uh, um, as a abutment for the space maintainer. No. Sorry, Dr. Yasin, I think your I voice is that you have to always. Sorry, yeah, we're having okay. trouble listening. Hear me? Yeah, we're having a bit of trouble listening to you talk. If you don't mind, just check with your 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 mic. Yes, 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 please. Yeah. Can I proceed with the question? Uh, are you able to? Sorry, are you on uh, he headphones, Dr. Yasin? Yes, 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 yes. Um, we'll proceed. But if there's a disturbance, I think it's better to come off the headphones and speak directly onto the mic. It would be better. Yeah, yeah, fine. Let me do. Yeah, that's okay. much. Okay, without further delay, let me start with the first question. Uh, this question is uh, from Dr. Kurad. She asks, if there is no adequate retention, how can we rectify that? Specifically, if the kid says the crown is lodged frequently. Dr. Zenith. Sir, retention is because of the, uh, is uh, from the cementation of the crown. So, uh, we just have to cement the crown into position. And I don't think I have never come across personally where a child has come uh, to me repeatedly saying the crown is getting dislodged again and again. Uh, it's probably, very, very rare for a stainless steel crown to. Yeah, probably. I think she was hinting if there is, you know, size difference of the crown, which is seated uh, to the kid and the kid comes back with the dislodgement. Do you feel that we should replace the crown or fix the same crown back? I think this is what she's trying to hint. Sir, if the crown selected and if the crown which was seated was proper, I mean, the correct size. And when, you, when, the, when the patient actually comes back to you with a dislodged crown, you can first try it out. You can place it and check for the adaptation, whether it is proper, whether it is meeting the all the criteria. So if all that is done, 
if, if it is proper, you can go ahead and, and uh, cement the same crown. There's no need for you to replace the crown. Thank you. Coming back to the second question, how do we remove these crowns if we have to? This is by Dr. Shiraz. He asks if we have to remove these crowns in the coming time for any issues which is anticipated. So how do we proceed with it? So once the crown is cemented onto the tooth and if you want to remove the crown, there is no other option but to cut the crown and remove it. So once you have done it, you only have to replace it with other, another stainless steel crown. So that is the only option. You cannot uh, remove the stainless steel crown without uh, destroying it. Uh, do you want to add anything on this, Dr. Yasin? Yeah, you can remove the crown using, as uh, Dr. Zinat uh, mentioned, you can use it, uh, you have to remove the crown only with the burr, because with the crown removing player, it cannot be removed. It's not that easy. You are going to distort the crown. Yeah, I, so I think probably... The option to, you have yeah. to go for any crown. I think the crown removing pliers are contraindicated in the pediatrics. The crown removing players are not contraindicated. You can use, but uh, anyway, you are going to distort the crown completely. This is going right, to happen. Sir. Right, sir. Fine. Jazakallah. The next question is from Dr. Nadeem. He asks why it should be seated 1 mm subgingivally. The crowns, why it should be seated 1 mm subgingivally. Sir, if it is not seated 1 mm subgingivally, you are creating an opening between the stainless steel crown and the tooth. So what will happen? There will be plaque accumulation leading to gingivitis. Why do you want that to happen in the first place? So extending the crown margin, 1 mm subgingivally will make sure to maintain the gingival health. So that is very, very important. Yeah, great, great, great. Uh, the next question is quite interesting. I think uh, both uh, the panel member and the speaker can answer this. What is the disinfection protocol taken prior to the cementation of crown, part one? The second part is, how about using T-scan? Is there any literature on this? You want me to repeat, Dr. Zenith? Yes, sir, please do. Yeah, uh, okay, I will split it into two and I will ask one by one. What is the disinfection protocol taken prior to cementation of the crown? Sir, uh... Actually, I mentioned regarding the reuse of crowns when you actually uh, do the trial and error method of fitting a stainless steel crown over a prepared tooth, you use multiple crowns. So when you do that, you finally select only one crown and place it over the prepared tooth. So when you do, uh, so what happens to the other crowns is you have to make sure you autoclave them and keep them back in the crown kit. So that way, whatever crown you pick from the crown kit, they are all sterilized. So I, and you will have placed that crown only on the patient who you are treating. And I don't think you need any special disinfecting uh, before, play, uh, before, before cementing that crown into position. Did I think only cleaning, cleaning the crown, uh, making sure that, you know, because you will trim the crown that there could be stainless steel debris all over. So make sure that there is nothing inside the crown and it is clean and it is dried. And once that is done, you can go ahead with cementation. Okay. Uh, should we disinfect the, the, the tooth prepared also? Is it Not necessary? Necess Not necessarily, sir. Okay. If there is, a, you know, a, a plaque formation, a thin biofilm which is there on the tooth, uh, how do we remove that? Do we have to polish the tooth before cementation? Mm, not that I know of, sir, because I have never done it and it is not in the books. But uh, preparing a tooth for a stainless steel crown hardly takes time. You know, Maybe if you are well versed with it, uh, especially it will take around 15 to 20 minutes maximum for you to prepare the tooth. And in that uh, time span, you are talking about plaque formation and whatever. I don't think it is that relevant. You know, you I need, need not say, actually, yeah, you I need, need not say, even. Yeah, yeah, please, please, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Continue. You need, you need not even do anything else. Only uh, rinsing of the tooth and drying it thoroughly should be enough and it should be good to go for cementation. Okay. Are there any possibilities that, you know, you send the kit back yeah. and call the kit in the second appointment and plan to fix the crown? That time you require any kind of polishing of the concerned tooth? 
No, sir. Actually, as far as uh, I am concerned, and uh, how much ever I am aware of, I have never placed a stainless steel crown in two appointments. So it is always a single appointment procedure. And once you do your crown cutting and you send the patient, there is always a chance that the teeth adjacent may migrate into it because you have done proximal reduction. So I would never recommend placing a stainless steel crown in two appointments. Right, right. Dr. Yasin, you were saying something. That for disinfecting the tooth, uh, if you talk about ALS technique, they hardly don't even remove the plaque and they are cementing the crown on good results. So it doesn't, is going to affect the outcome of the, the crown. Okay, right, fine. Thank you. And uh, the, the question was asked by Dr. Khurat, the same thing, we continue with the second part. How about using a T-scan, any literature? Do the we use T-scans? -scan. Yeah. T-scan is nothing but, you know, it is a computer anal uh, based analysis of the occlusion. It uses paper thin, um, uh, sensors to assess the occlusion, but uh, I have not really come across uh, this in literature. I'm sorry to say. Dr. Yasin, any literature supporting T scans yeah, in pediatric dentistry? Uh, not much literature, even uh, I have gone through regarding this, doctor. Yeah, right, fine. Sorry, is can I? Is sorry, I think Dr. Khurat wants to continue that question. She's requested to, be, uh, to unmute, so I'm going to unmute her. Um, she would like to just take that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Please proceed. Correctly. Yeah. Uh, doc, I just wanted to ask is uh, like uh, for disinfection particularly, like I just wanted to know like uh, when we are placing inside the oral cavity, right? So there'll be so much saliva. Like what you told was the disinfection protocol for like when we keep using like different crowns and then autoclave. That is a different thing. I just wanted to know is that like if we are using crowns, like we just try to put in and check like whether it's fitting or not. Now, finally, you know that one particular crown is fitting. So I just wanted to know since we are using it in the oral cavity, the entanglement of the surface, any disinfection protocol needs to be followed because we are using a luting cement, right? So I just wanted to know whether there is any interference with that luting cement. Is it important that we have to disinfect only the inner surface of the crown or something like that is there, Doc? Not that I'm aware of. No, absolutely no. not. Uh, actually, you place your stainless steel crown. When you cement mm -hmm. it, you do it under strict isolation. So there is no chance that saliva no, no, contaminates no, 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 your... No, Doc. No, no, no. Whenever you, you take a crown and you keep fitting inside, definitely there is so much saliva even if you're cutting the rubber dam interproximally there will be some uh, leakage which will happen so we are cutting the interproximal area to do the proximal uh, cutting or the stripping so there will be some amount of saliva so complete isolation without i mean when you're cutting it it's not possible but there will be some amount of saliva contamination for sure so i just wanted to know like we can if we can disinfect the internal surface or something like that uh, actually, I could look into it and get back to you later. Thank probably. you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. And one more thing, Doc. The first question I asked for the retention was, I just wanted to know, like normally in permanent dentition, what we do is we place this uh, retentive grooves, doctor. If you know yes. if there is, yeah. So I just wanted to know, like I have uh, come across, though I don't do any pediatric cases, but I've come across from many of my pediatric friends they say that, you know, sometimes there is not always few, few times that there is, you know, patient complaints of uh, the kids dislodged crown. So, uh, like they asked me, like, uh, you know, uh, is there any method, you know, like uh, rather than, you know, uh, changing the crown or going into something else like, you know, retentive grooves or something can be placed or no. So, few of my friends had asked this doc. So, I thought I'll ask you. If we could None of that is there. actually... Okay, none of that is actually required, though various authors have recommended. Uh, there was one author who had recommended placing vertical grooves once yeah, the tooth was prepared. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily contribute to the retention of the crown. So that okay. is only, it is like a suggestion, you know, you okay. could do that. But okay. ultimately, the retention of the stainless steel crown is from cementation. Okay. So that is what I mm -hmm. told you when I showed you the slide of mm -hmm. uh, that study, which was conducted by Savid and others. So mm -hmm. that was the study. They, uh, they, uh, they had five different tooth preparations. 
mm-hmm. and they uh, checked for the retention of the crown before cementation and after cementation and they concluded mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. if the buccal and the lingual undercuts are maintained okay mm-hmm. before cementation that will be the uh, means of retention but okay. after cementation you know no matter what sort of preparation was there all mm-hmm. the five uh, types of preparations had almost the same amount of retention after cement was cementation was done okay so i think cementation is a primary contributing Most factor yes okay. in uh, uh, retention of a stainless steel crown okay doc this is what i wanted to ask you thank you yeah okay thank you can i proceed with the next question yes sir please yeah uh the next question is by dr asim i think he is unmuted uh, uh the host has unmuted him can you ask your question dr asim yeah thank you thank you uh, dr nadeem uh, thank you dr zinat for the excellent presentation and thank you uh, yasin dr yasin my question is regarding uh, the use of stainless steel crown in bruxism uh see bruxism uh, actually we use a splint splint will be more better because the uh, um the fundamental uh, thing occlusal splint, splint plays a fundamental orthopedic role in order to quickly erase the occlusal memory to balancing occlusion and reduce the wear facet by giving a crown don't you think it will increase the interference one of the etiological factor for bruxism is the interference and the developing uh, occlusion in children but by giving a uh, by giving a metal crown don't you think it is going to increase the bruxism for the child what is your take on this doctor okay so whenever uh, you come across a patient with bruxism who has a lot of attrition of the primary posterior teeth uh, let me mention that uh, there is the attrition could lead to loss of vertical dimension of occlusion right mm. and uh, the patient may even have some amount of sensitivity which would make daily activities difficult mastication difficult so to facilitate all that i think placing a stainless steel crown is a, a good enough option you know you want to restore the form and function of the tooth so that the, the uh, f- uh, form and function is maintained you know the patient can eat the food the patient can chew the food you know uh, or else you know uh, if you do not do it if you do not place a crown there will be further attrition of the occlusal aspect of the crown uh, followed by pulpal exposure you may have to do more complicated procedures proceed with pulp therapy and uh, it is never ending you know uh, so primarily you actually have to do something where your patient can stop bruxism altogether right so what is the etiology of bruxism you can just take care of that and make sure that your patient can overcome bruxism but placing a stainless steel crown is to maintain the form and function of the tooth you know because bruxism leads to attrition of the tooth you want to maintain you want to restore the form and function of the tooth that is why you are placing these stainless steel crowns and uh, i i actually have not come across anything uh, which says uh stainless steel crowns uh you know are um, make things more difficult once placed in uh, patients with bruxism so i could just give it a reading again and i could get back to you sir with the necessary information yeah thank you thank you very much ma thank you dr yasin any add ons on this uh, question please approved is always preferred for treating bruxism the main uh, motive behind uh, giving a crown in a bruxism patient is to restore the form function because when there is a loss of tooth structure you have to prevent the sensitivity in the patient and uh, stainless steel crown is more given rather than managing the bruxism i hope it's clear uh, can you repeat that please because uh, your audio your audio is quite feeble i think it's your bandwidth which is low can you just repeat as dr basha bhai said the primary treatment is going with the occlusal uh, objective here giving a stainless steel crown is to restore the form and the function so because of uh, bruxism if there is an assumption the patient can experience in sensitivity as dr zinat said it's better to give the stainless steel crown only for the restoration of the form and the function rather than the treating the bruxism 
right fine thank you thank you dr yasin thank you very much jazakallah khair thank you yeah the next question is from dr iftakhar he asks uh, please elaborate on pediatric rubber dam kit and uh, trough modification on it dr zinat dr yasin did you get my question you want me to repeat the question again oh sir i heard you actually but i i really have to read it up once you know uh, in detail to give an explanation regarding that i'm extremely sorry for that uh, dr yasin if somebody else if we use a 5 by 5 inch rubber dam sheet and uh, ivory clamp 3 is of uh, primary molars the technique is uh, just an extension whatever uh, clamp uh, tooth we are clamping we have we have to just extend to the tooth to the next to the uh, to the next tooth so that uh, we can get a better isolation for the preferring tooth yeah right see generally if uh, i am doing uh, if i have to appoint uh, appoint on this i generally what i do is i cut the rubber dam sheet uh since it is uh, freely available as 5 by 5 or 6 by 6 i generally cut it small uh because uh, the the larger the rubber dam sheet it gives the sense of you know uh, uh claustrophobic it makes very claustrophobic to the pediatric patients so you cut the sheet out probably you can make it as a u groove near the nasal area and you know you can intact that sheet yeah uh i think we have a lot of pediatric dentists on board uh anyone uh, doing uh, rd procedures in pediatric uh, cases also can uh, can appoint on this uh, we have dr ramiz dr uh, umair uh, dr gausia alhamdulillah if anybody would like to have a you know give a point a take away point on this a message could you sorry could you message me if you want me to unmute anyone yeah can you uh, unmute uh, dr umair Sorry, who was that? Did you say? Dr. Umair. Dr. Umair. Sorry, I don't think he's here. Okay, fine, 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 fine. Anybody else you'd like me to unmute? Uh, I still have. Uh, uh, we have Dr. Ramiz and Dr. Aisha Taha also. Even they can op opine on this. Dr. Ramiz, can you just raise your hand so that you know it's very easy for us to identify in the names? because we have you know so many participants here can you just raise your hand there you have a small icon there emoji icon dr ramiz dr aisha taha is not here either i think dr ramiz is here i can i can unmute ramiz yeah 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 i want me to i want me to dr ramiz and dr taha is i think she's probably gone out and she come back no problem we can we can we can could we ask uh, dr gausia as well i'm going to unmute uh, dr gausia for her opinion that would be great that would be great actually okay fantastic so we you can proceed thank you yeah dr ramiz and dr gausia can you opine on the last question i would just repeat the question please elaborate on pediatric rubber dam kit and trough modifications on it I think Dr. Yasin has already answered it, sir. It's similar to the regular rubber dam kit, except the distillation. The clamp is placed in the distal tooth of the one next to the tooth uh, to be prepared. So it's nothing different. It's just the name the nomenclature given to the technique, which is. Uh, otherwise, it's a similar procedure what any endodontist would follow. That's great. That's great. And even the rubber dam size is smaller, sir. Five by five. Uh, that is mentioned. Size of the rubber dam. It's five by five. Five by five. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, fine. Uh, the next question is uh, by Dr. Shah. She asks, "Can you shed more light on how the occlusion settles in a primary dentition if there is less than 1.5 mm of occlusal interference?" Uh, that's because of the dynamic occlusion, sir. Because uh, in kids, uh, the tooth is in. Uh, uh, no the mo movement is dynamic it gets settled down in like 2 to 3 days the accommodation is very well uh, taken up by the child even if irrespective of how uh, how much of interference happens in the occlusion 
So that's one uh, fortunate thing the pediatric dentists deal with. Dental alveolar adaptation is better in children. Yes. Also, I just want to attend to Dr. Kurit's question about the disinfection and the trial and procedure. Uh, so, if uh, whatever Dr. Zenith has mentioned in, throughout the procedure, like throughout the presentation, if all the principles are followed, I don't see the you know the possibilities of trial and error happening so many times unless the clinician is an amateur himself or herself. So there's no question. Uh, maximum times we follow the size number, size four. Very rarely we use the size five. So there is hardly any trial and error. And the procedure is uh, taking within the blink, blink of an eye. So, you know, there's no question of, and there is no question of grooving the crown also. So the principles are very straightforward. Whatever is mentioned in the presentation, if it is followed, if it is nicely uh, taken care, then I don't think so there's any possibility of uh, such complications happening. Unless we miss any of the any of the uh, steps mentioned by Dr. Seaman. Yes, I think we can proceed. Unmute me, Dr. Mubarak. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for unmuting me, Dr. Mubarak. I think I have lost all the questions on the chat section. Yeah, I'm not able to see any of the questions here. Okay, fine. I'll I'll proceed with the next question. This yeah, please is from do Dr. so. I just logged out and logged in again. I don't know some uh, technical error here. I'm not able to see any of the chat questions. I'll, okay, uh, if you guys could uh, just send the questions on the general uh, uh, chat group, please, and I'll take over. Thank you. Yeah, now, I'm very sorry. Got... I'm very sorry about this. That's okay, Nadim. It's okay. Technical errors happen. Right now, we've got. I've got another question. I am going to uh, put this question forward to. Um, Dr. Yasin. Uh, this is from Dr. Musharraf Funisa. She's asked, um, "How about dipping the quest? Uh, sorry, dipping the crowns. Sorry, just a moment. I think I've just gone up. Yeah. How about dipping the crown in saline and dry the crown and then do the cementation? That is what I have uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, when you talk about Hall's technique, they hardly do anything. They don't even remove the plaque biofilm on the tooth, as well as the crown. They directly place the crown. So this uh, dipping in the saline or anything, any other disinfectant using doesn't uh, benefit in any way the outcome of the crown. So this is what the literature says. So, I mean, this is this is just me talking on top uh, over that follow up for the, uh, of the question. I think Kurat's uh, query was the same. So. In Hall's technique, you mean to say that they leave all the plaque underneath the crown and then just place the crown on top? Yes, 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 yes. Isn't it contradictory to leaving bacteria inside and just exactly, coming? exactly? There is a lot of controversy. Generally, it is, is uh, not very well accepted in the I mean, in the US as well as in the Canada, but it is largely practiced in UK. What they say is that uh, once you seal off the uh, when once you stop the plaque getting the metabolites from the external environment, the progression of the caries is halted. So, but there are a lot of controversies. Sometimes uh, the case selection is more important regarding Hall's technique. You should have a very good uh, definite, defined layer of dentin between the pulp and the caries solution. Only then you go for Hall's technique. If you don't uh, take up the, the case clearly, then sometimes it can go for irreversible pulpitis. In that case, if it goes for an irreversible pulpitis, even in that case, you don't have to remove the crown completely. You can just remove the occlusal surface, do the complete the pulpectomy procedure, and seal the crown. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's go to the next question. Excuse me, I have a question to uh, Dr. Yasin. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yasin. Alaikum salam, Dr. Katawar is Dr. Shiraz. Fine. Alhamdulillah. I'm seeing you after uh, probably uh, 15 years, I think, 18 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's been a long time. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, usually when we are talking about crowns to the uh, patients, the parents of the pa the kid, usually they have one, uh, one question. They always ask whether these crowns will fall off with the uh, shedding tooth. So how do we uh, convince the parents about this? and what actually happens uh, uh, when it is falling. 
So I just want to have it from you. It Thank is you. Uh, generally a parent's apprehension that uh, what will happen to the crown uh, when the tooth gets exfoliated. Basically, it is a normal process. It just follows the exfoliation process. And even the crown gets shed off along with the tooth. Yeah. So neither the parent has to worry nor the dentist has to worry. It is nothing much as the, because most of the exfoliation occurs following resorption of the two root. So maximum resorption more than half of the root is resorbed. The mobility starts, physiological mobility starts. And uh, most often the crown, the, we are adapting only the crown portion. We are nowhere related to other aspects of the resorption of the root or anything. So it often shuts off with the crown, nothing to worry about that as such. Thank you. Done? Done? Yeah, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Right, let's go to the next question. This is from Dr. Inza Rehana. If retention of the crown is owed to cementing medium, then how much emphasis should we put forth towards mechanical preparation of the tooth? And ideally, how long should it take to prepare the crown sufficiently, if not too much focus laid on it? So basically, she's uh, um, have we answered this question? Dr. Zina? No, no, no. no, no, no. Right, no, so sir. She, no, sir. She, she's asking uh, if, re, well, you mentioned in your talk that retention is, uh, is owed to the cementing medium. Uh, so how much emphasis should be put forward to the mechanical preparation? If, if, it, if, if cementation is what is holding the crown, how much, uh, how much time or how much emphasis we need to, um, you know, put forward towards mechanical preparation of the tooth? Okay, so first of all, uh, when we go ahead with the tooth preparation, okay? We have to make sure that we have to conserve as much tooth structure as possible for the crown to seat over the tooth structure, yes? So if you uh, uh, do too much of occlusal reduction again, uh, some amount of mechanical reduction, uh, mechanical retention is in fact there from the, tooth, uh, from the tooth reduction procedure, from the tooth preparation. So if you uh, do not uh, pay attention to the proximal reduction and create an interproximal ledge. So again, you cannot place the crown. So you have to give importance to the proper occlusal reduction and the proximal reduction and rounding of all the line angles and the point angles. It is all mandatory. Only after you have prepared the tooth correctly, then you can go ahead to adapt, this, uh, to, uh, adapt the crown of the correct size over the prepared tooth. And uh, coming to the next part of it, how much time do you need uh, to uh, prepare a crown uh, sufficiently? It actually depends on your skill. You know, if you are well versed with it, I don't think you will take a lot of time in uh, doing that. So if you are still in the learning process, you may take a longer time than uh, most of the people who are well versed with the procedure. So that is all, uh, you know, technique sensitive. You know, it depends on you. If you've learned the procedure, you will uh, do it good enough. Okay, uh, Dr. Yasin, anything you, you'd like to add? Um, according to the literature, 50% of the retention comes from the cementing media. And apart, the remaining retention comes from the mechanical aspects. The major retention for the stainless steel crown comes from the undercut, that is, it engages below the gingival one third of the crown. So apart from that, the proximal convergence, what you give, as well as the close adaptation of the crown, the proper selection of the crown, the close adaptation of the crown plays a significant role in the retention. So basic concept is how close you adapt the crown to the tooth structure matters a lot how long the crown is going to retain in the mouth. So I'm going to ask Fayaz to um, talk. I think he's raised his hand. I think he wanted to speak something about this. Uh, Fayaz, can you... Sorry, he's muted himself again. So let's proceed. Um, so shall we proceed to the next question? Yes. Uh, we've got Syed Abdul Manan asking, what are aesthetic crown options in anterior region? Can you name a few? I personally think that wasn't the topic of the day today, but um, um, I, if anybody wants to just give a quick uh, review of it, maybe on a different day we could ask them to, um, you know, give a talk on aesthetic crowns for pediatric teeth. Is that okay? That yes, would be fine, actually. So, that would be fine. 
because aesthetic crowns is a different topic to be discussed on separate day so let's stick on to you know this what what is the topic uh, composed of for today's brilliant yeah so we will talk about aesthetic crowns on a different day if that's all right let's go to the next question if the har has asked another question right this is uh, on pediatric teeth stainless steel crown versus inlay onlay in a grossly carious teeth or tooth on pediatric teeth do you actually do inlays and onlays dr zina no sir i have never done it but i'm sure the senior faculty can answer that could we ask uh, dr yasin or dr gosia to uh, this is not generally very much preferred in the primary teeth the reason being that uh, child's cooperation is a big factor in providing treatment for the kids so this full coverage restorations are more preferred rather than inlays or onlays so this has a better longevity and a better cooperation with the patient as well as the parent brilliant so dr ma'am rosie ma'am do you want to add something to it the morphology of the tooth also which matters so which uh, refrains us from doing those uh, onlays or inlays and i think sir is asking for a permanent tooth I think permanent tooth we still prefer if we as pediatric dentists are doing we would do semi permanent restoration and then hand over the case respectively to the uh, the endodontists so we would not enter that domain I think that that is a question sir has been asking there Yeah I reckon that's that's correct yeah right let's go to the next one I think Dr Fayaz has something to ask can you unmute him uh, I just did he muted himself again okay I'll unmute yeah. him Right Dr Fayaz you can go ahead Assalamu alaikum uh, nice presentation dr zina yeah uh, it's regarding the i have two three uh, points to make uh, uh, regarding the tooth preparation uh, see uh, uh, just like uh, unlike uh, how we do tooth preparation for permanent teeth uh, i think uh, tooth preparation for uh, deciduous teeth is uh, and fitting the crown is like uh, retrofitting because uh, in permanent teeth we do preparation we take impression and then we make the crown according to the tooth preparation but in pediatric cases i think we have to uh, already crown is ready and we have to do tooth preparation according to the crown that's called uh, retrofitting so uh, the problem here i think uh, comes more because retrofitting is more difficult than you know actually doing tooth preparation and making a making a crown in the lab so now my uh, regarding two three points uh, which we just discussed now about the mechanical retention for the crown and the cement which we use so i think the mechanical retention uh, is just like uh, i think we have uh, not much to do anything other than just doing uh, overall reduction and probably providing one or two uh, grooves if uh, it's it's really required again uh, when you check the crown i think you have three four sizes and you are going to check and uh, regarding this i think cement selection again uh, we should have uh, a different types like uh, you have some uh, transitional cements or you have more permanent cements i think uh, retention should be decided i think on chair uh, if there is more permanent retention is or more retention is required which can be you know uh, achieved by the more uh, more stronger cements Uh, this is what i feel and regarding the occlusion i just wanted to one add one point if you see the development of occlusion in children uh, the, the actually the condyles are still developing so we just can't uh, have a proper occlusion because we we never get a good centric occlusion or or we sometimes say there is no centric occlusion in children because still condyles are developing uh, in the fossa so occlusion will get adjust itself and only after permanent teeth come we take occlusion into consideration I think high points will all go unnoticed and uh, they get corrected until unless they are very very high. Uh, this is what I wanted to just add. Uh, that's it. I think the crimping and contouring does the lot of magic. So more than the grooves, the crimping and contouring, yeah. the stoning is what. So unlike the permanent, that is where we differ in pediatrics. So most of the work is taken care by the skills, the manipulation of the stainless steel crown, how we are adapting to the anatomical crown which we have. 
Exactly. So if you even if you have in permanent call, even if you have a point uh, two mm high point or point one mm high point, patient can notice it. Whereas in pediatric cases, even if you keep point five mm high point, children will not notice it or will not be able to do it because uh, you know there is no proper occlusion, so it will get adjusted. So that's a forgiving factor or an advantage. We get it to because I think we get to handle the behavior management part. So I think that uh, balances the thing for us. Yeah, that's like uh, yeah the other aspect of uh, handling the kids. And uh, regarding the T scan, I don't think so. T scan will be much useful other than just seeing the contacts, how many contacts are there in the children or something. But uh, in studying or establishing the occlusal scheme or occlusion, uh, it's of uh, no use in the pediatric cases. That's what I think. I second. I'm done, doctor. No, doctor Thank you. I'll mute. I'll mute you again. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute Dr. Iftikhar. I think he's uh, have had a few queries. Uh, I'd ask him to put it across if you, if you don't mind. So, Dr. Ahmed, you can put forward the question. Uh, Zinat, uh, actually, I think in your slide you had mentioned about uh, this uh, crown uh, indicated for a permanent tooth where there's, uh, uh, what do you say, a carious involvement, uh, grossly decayed. Uh, is that right? Am I right on that? Uh, no, for a primary tooth, sir. Not it's grossly okay. decayed. Huh. Extensive decay, okay. which That's involves what, more decay. than yes, more than two surfaces of the tooth. So you you said it is indicated in extensive decayed permanent tooth, right? No, no, no. Primary tooth. Okay, I thought. Okay, in that uh, slide, I thought it was something like that. Okay, why not? Uh, we just do a regular crown preparation, like how we do for a permanent tooth. And take an impression, send it to the lab, and uh, do because as Fayaz was mentioning about the complicities of these uh, uh, these crowns, what you do on uh, pedo patients, why not just uh, do preparation and like how we do for a regular uh, permanent to take an impression, send it to the lab, and get it? Don't you think that would be more better? I mean, I do, though it is a two sitting procedure, but what's your take on it? Sir, as I mentioned before. If you want to place a crown in two settings, you know, uh, so if you want to make an impression and send it to the lab for the fabrication of the crown. So once you prepare the tooth and you send the patient and uh, ma there could be loss of space, you know, because the uh, Probably two, three could... days loss of space, is it? So, uh, yes, possibly. Yes. So you do not want that to happen. And preformed crowns are a much better option for primary teeth. So you can place it in a single sitting. And uh, uh, as I told you, the various advantages of these, you know, you want to uh, send, uh, make an impression and send it to the lab. How much money is it going to cost to the patient? The stainless steel crowns are much more cost effective that way. You know, you have to take into consideration all the various advantages stainless steel crown holds over the other forms of crown you know, which you are talking about. So I think if we consider that and weigh out our op options, I think stainless steel crown would be a better choice to go ahead with uh, uh, placing on a primary tooth rather than, you know, some other thing. Okay, thank you. Right, Dr. Fayaz wants to just uh, give his opinion on that. Uh, I'll let him speak, Fayaz. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sapsalam, it's, it's a good question. Actually, uh, you know, uh, what you say, it makes sense. Actually, uh, if you want to give a very good crown, you need to prepare, make an impression and, you know, prepare the crown uh, passively in the lab and fix it. That's the best thing you can do for anybody, whether it's a child or a, you know, adult. Uh, you know, you can take a lot of things into consideration and the whole case will be in your control. Uh, but, but uh, you know, in pediatric cases, what will happen, I think uh, we are trying to ease the procedure because we know that it's going to stay for only two or three years. We know, we know that it's going to fall. And that's why we are trying to, uh, you know, retrofit the crowns uh, on an imaginary or, you know, uh, on a prepared tooth. Uh, and we try and fit it uh, uh, with the other instruments. I think uh, it's just a transitional, uh, um, you know, phase. Uh, that's why I think stainless steel crowns are used. But uh, I think in, uh, if you can they will take an impression and do a temporary crown. And again, the, uh, regarding the sp uh, space, uh, what doctor mentioned in two, three days, uh, you know, chair side you can do a temporary crown and fix yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. In most of the cases, what I do uh, sometimes when uh, uh, I mean I don't work on uh, 
primary teeth but a lot of uh, kids come in uh, when they have some orthodontic treatment and some permanent teeth are um, you know uh, root canal done and uh, we have to preserve them or we have to say uh, protect them so the, that time we do chair side temporary crowns and uh, acrylic crowns and uh, we leave them until the orthodontic treatment is completed uh, especially on uh, molars or things like that so uh, definitely if you uh, can handle uh, good uh, chair side temporary acrylic crowns that also will do a very good job i think for the uh, pediatric cases but again uh, for your question uh, specifically for your question i think if you take impression and do a you know a, even a simple cast crown that will be the best thing i think uh, we can do it but uh, these are all just to like save cost or to save the time and things like that i think doctor has given that answer that's mm. all the, this is what my opinion yeah, yeah very well put up yeah thanks thank you i think uh, dr fayaz i think uh, very well said uh, from the prosthodontist point of view let us look through a, a pediatric dentist point of view because this is quite a, a elaborate procedure but uh, what dr zinath and dr yasin said dr yasin do you agree with uh, do you concur with uh, dr fayaz what he said would you like to you know prep the crown send it to the lab and get it back and you know fit the crown so this is not very much feasible with the kids the reason being that the morphology of the primary tooth the thickness of the enamel and the dentin if you see it is very less when you talk about the permanent teeth and the primary teeth there are a lot of differences if you do a cast metal crown and a stainless steel crown that much extensive preparation cannot be done for a primary tooth exactly. so in such conditions minimal preparation and it uh, it is a semi permanent restoration i am not saying stainless steel crown is a permanent restoration this is semi permanent restoration it has to last for another 6 to 8 years that is the life of the stainless steel crown whether you give it for a primary tooth or a permanent molar so right. later it has to be replaced so i think this is more apt and this is the best thing that can be done for a primary tooth okay uh, continuing with the same question I imagine there is wear and tear of the ss crown can we repair that uh, ss crown uh, on the chair side and the patient comes to you and there is small perforation and they say there is food lodgement in the occlusal part can we remove the crown and you know uh, rectify the same crown and seat it back sir if there is a lot of wear okay uh, yes. you the only choice is for us to replace the crown but if the wear is confined to a small area over the crown you can uh place a restoration over that you know you could give an amalgam restoration just to preclude the uh, cement from dissolving away and creating a defect so you could do that but it is uh, only when the area the uh, wear is confined to a very small area can we solder it uh, dr zero can we do soldering uh soldering when sir if if there is any pinpoint perforation where occlusal contacts are high masticatory forces are high and there is any perforation can we remove the crown and use a solder and there and you can cover that area sir again i will just tell you remind you that you know to remove a stainless steel crown we have no other option but to cut it and exactly. remove it exactly exactly so it's always better to you know either replace the crown or you know yes. fill it with a kind of a gic or a composite resin yes. right yes 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 yeah, absolutely great. Uh, we have a next question. Uh, yes, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Sayed yeah. the M. Martin what he said uh, yeah. regarding the tooth preparation. Uh, actually, when we do a cast crown, a metal crown, we just need to, you know, as less as we can prepare 0.5 millimeters, and uh, you know, uh, we can make a cast crown. We don't have to really go for extensive preparation like all ceramic restorations we do, and. Uh, uh, it's only the biggest disadvantage, as Dr. Uh, Sayed M. Martin said. uh it is like two appointment procedure uh, you know uh, treating the child making the impression is more cumbersome but uh, uh, the, uh, other than those disadvantages uh, uh as uh, we do the cast crown in the lab and cement it we'll have as i said more control over it and dr nadim what you pointed out see the stainless steel crowns are very very uh, you know thin they are the thickness is very less so that's why they might get perforated over a period of time those things can be avoided with all this uh so that's how there was a one uh, big uh, lecture of handling uh, pediatric cases prosthodontically and so i think i have that but uh, uh, this uh, we can have a discussion it's a inter department discussion so those are all the things uh, handling uh, the edential spaces and things like that uh, but anyway uh, i think i just wanted to add this point for that question just to add a bit the moment we proximally slice the tooth There is a 
scarcity of space loss, the danger of space loss within 72 hours of. That is the reason even space maintainers, we uh, suggest to do it immediately before the tooth extraction. And then uh, once the space maintainer is ready, then is when, whenever it is ideal, we tend to remove the tooth. So space loss is one concern which overrules and that's the reason we don't do it in two sittings. This proximal slicing endangers our space. And the whole idea of uh, preserving the tooth structure with semi-permanent restoration is maintaining the arch length. So space discrepancy, arch length is our main motto. So we would not want to encroach into that matter. But you could also give a temporary uh, chair side crown. Said, uh, those yeah, chair side uh, temporary crown can be. Steel crown, sir, which is a better option, which is ready available, rather than going for an axle wake and then going for a, because we uh, we are looking for the durability and the retention. So nothing is matchable when it comes to retention as stainless steel crown. The snap fit which we get with the crown, contouring and crimping with the stainless steel crown, the malleability and the adaptation, basically to the occlusion which is dynamic. Uh, nothing beats the stainless steel crown. No, no material uh, beats that. No, the, my point is, see, we are, whatever we are doing, we are retrofitting the crown to the tooth. So, uh, whereas in the lab, uh, when we cast the crown, we prepare the crown, we do a wax up on the prepared tooth, then we cast the crown. So, uh, regarding the this this crown material is not uh, adaptable as uh, malleable or adaptable as the stainless steel crowns. Uh, I think. Exactly, but but uh, when we think about the retention uh, and the passivity of the fit, we can achieve in the lab better than doing intra orally with the stainless steel crown by retrofitting. That's what I mean to say. Uh, aesthetic zirconia crowns are passively fit. The stainless steel crowns, the whole criteria or the endorsement which happens is based on the active fit, the snug fit, which we call it, the belling effect. I think doctor has already spoken. The belling effect yeah. is not fit. The crimp and contour is the key. So that, yes. uh, you know, that is the whole thing. Yes. But I think we are, we are slightly deviating from uh, the topic, what the yes. actual talk was. So Fayaz, thank you for your inputs. Uh, I'm going to ask Nadeem to continue with the next question. I think. Yeah, yeah. This, is from, this is from Dr. Parviz. He asks, instead of giving a local anesthesia and doing crown preparation, can't we just place separators uh, interdentally and call the kid after two days and uh, go ahead with the crowning, just as how we do in Hall's technique. Uh, first of all, Hall's technique is not recommended on all teeth and uh, not on all children. So that must be taken into account and the indications for the placement of, this, of a stainless steel crowns are different from the indications of Hall technique. So in, uh, you can uh, actually stainless steel crown is indicated. Uh, I've discussed that, you know, the various, there are various indications, but on technique, you can uh, actually place it in case of class one uh, uh, cavities uh, where, you know, uh, you cannot actually place um, conventional restoration because of, uh, because the, uh, the child doesn't want it, or in case of cavitated and non-cavitated lesions, uh, class two lesions. And Hall's technique is absolutely contraindicated in teeth with irreversible pulpitis, teeth which exhibit uh, mobility, and teeth which show uh, an abscess, you know, which have an abscess. So all these are contraindications for the placement of a Hall crown. So you cannot place a Hall crown on all the teeth. So you cannot uh, think of placing a separator and uh, sending the patient and then placing a hall crown on this a tooth. I don't so the in yes, yes. Uh, yes. ma'am, please go ahead. Hall's technique, if we go to the history of it, it is basically in the public industry, which uh, wherein there is less socioeconomic background for the African countries where we could not, uh, you know, have the provision of preparing the crowns. That is when it was introduced. So, as such, it is not recommended otherwise. Yes, we can continue. Okay. Uh, just to summarize this question again, is it advisable that we place the separators rather than you know cutting the proximal contacts, send the patient away, call the patient again after two days, you know, uh, take the selective crown which is there in your uh, drawer and fit it. That is what he is asking basically. Yes, sir, I mentioned in the presentation that if you uh, when a um, 
a distant tooth is not present. You know, if you're placing a crown on a second primary molar and first permanent molar has not yet erupted, still you have to go ahead with the pro distal proximal preparation of the crown as well. Why? Because if you do not do that, there is always a chance that you uh, select an oversized crown you know, to fit onto the tooth preparation. So you want to avoid that at all costs, because if you do not, if your crown selection is not proper, again, retention is going for a toss. So you have to make sure that distal and mesial proximal slicing is done adequately. Right. So that has to be done and separators are not a replacement for that. Excellent, excellent, fine. Um, I have next question from Dr. Furat. She asks, particular to Dr. Zenat, uh, autoclaving uh, does it change the you know uh, the uh, any kind of the crown dimension or the metallurgy or any kind? Does it deform the crown by any chance when you autoclave no, those SS crowns? No, sir, it doesn't. Okay, right, fine. And uh, any more questions uh, from the participants? Yeah, uh, I have a, I have a question. Uh, how about avoiding you know uh, crown itself and you secure the tooth with a good composite filling itself? It basically depends on uh, the cooperation of the patient. If you can maintain a good isolation and the patient is cooperative, you can always go for a composite restoration. But generally, if it is a multi-surface restoration. Better to go for a stainless steel crown as it gives a complete coverage. Because uh, there is a caries in the mesial aspect, as a caries in the distal aspect, you restore both sides composite. Over a period of time, if anything fractures or anything, the child patient doesn't report and uh, it can go for a uh, irreversible pulpitis. So, if there is multi surface caries, it is always better to go for the full coverage restorations. Anything to add, Dr. Rosia? I have I have one more query uh, to Dr. Yasin. Uh, imagine a kid uh, who is a vertical grower, okay, and you're and you're doing a palpectomy for the lower any of the quadrant, particularly D's, and you place a crown. What are the possibilities of the kid developing pseudoclass three occlusion? Eight four. Eight four. I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, I didn't get your question, sir. Okay, I'm asking. A young kid who is a vertical mm -hmm. grower mm -hmm. and you do pulpectomy for lower D's and you place a stainless steel crown, mm -hmm. there are possibility, possibilities that kid might develop a pseudo class 3 because the crown is interfering with, your, with his opposing tooth and he tends mm -hmm. to get his jaw to that particular side. What is your take on this? We always try to, if you are going for a conventional approach, not an all technique, you try to restore the occlusion as much as possible, what is existing before. Like for example, before going for a preparation, you can check the canine relation. And after the seating the crown, if you establish the same canine relation, you are not going to interfere with the occlusion. So do you recall the patient on regular basis to check whether yes, of course, of course. Any, 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 if you, if you give a crown, uh, anything, a frequent recall is always required. I recommend pre periodic recall as well as radiographic evaluation is essential. Because I have seen few kids, you know, when you place lower crowns, particularly on the D's, they mm -hmm. tend to get their jaw to that particular side to fidget to that particular crown. Mm -hmm. So you, they tend to develop a sort of what happens is, Initially, what happens is they feel something that uh, is just like a denture. Yeah, they have something new in their mouth. Initially, they have that habit, but over a period of time, they get used to that. But uh, if you maintain a proper occlusion, if you restore what was there before, Chances of uh, developing to pseudo class 3 is very less, as far as I understand. Right, fine. Uh, I think we are done with the questions. Uh, uh, any more questions on the list? Let, just let me check, Dr. Mubarak, whether I've missed any question or not. Just let me check once. Please do. Yeah, I think we are done with the questions. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we dive in your way. Thank you very much. For to thank, all you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, all GDP team for organizing such informative webinars. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for spending your time and thank you, Rosia, ma'am, for giving us some of your inputs. Um, 
I'd like to conclude this. And if you do require any further doubts and any questions to be clarified, please post it on the GDP group and uh, panel members and the speakers would be happy to answer it. But thank you all for spending your valuable time. Um, thank you.